I'm reliably informed they go down very well on YouTube, so I thought, well, yes, we should make a cat video. So Cheshire Cat is a character from Alice in Wonderland, um, and this cat is famous for the fact that when it grins, the cat disappears, but the grin stays behind. Well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat? It's the most curious thing I ever saw in all my life. So this is a paper entitled Observation of a Quantum Cheshire Cat in a Matter Wave Interferometer Experiment. Although it's a great tagline, it actually fits as well. They have done this amazing thing, so just as your Cheshire Cat, somehow the smile gets separated from the cat. Um, they've basically taken some property of an elementary particle, in this case a neutron, and separated it from the particle. So its grin is actually its, its uh, magnetic moment, its magnetism. So they have somehow managed to take a neutron, which has a magnetic moment, and they've separated the magnetism from the particle. Neutrons are neutral in the sense that they have no electric charge associated with them, but they do have a magnetic moment. In other words, they do behave like tiny little magnets. Probably the way to think about it is if you take a neutron and put it in a, in a magnetic field, then the magnetic field and the, and, and the magnetic moment of the neutron will interact with each other, um, and you know, they'll attract and twist each other around and so on, because the you know, two magnets are repelling or repul repulsing each other. What, have, what has this team done? They have physically separated the particle from its magnetic moment. So are you going to tell me more, or are you just going to keep telling <laughs> I'll keep, me? That? I can keep telling you. <laughs> Do you want me to show you how they did it? I'd love you to. Okay, so it's a bit involved, but I have some pictures. Okay, so we're in the world of quantum mechanics, which means basically things behave in very strange ways, um, but it means we have to sort of think in some of the quantum mechanical terms, and in particular, one of the things that's going to feature in this experiment is this concept of weak measurement, which we've also talked about in the past. It's basically, the trouble with quantum mechanical systems is when you start measuring them, the properties of the system change. But there's this concept of weak measurement, which involves measuring things sufficiently gently that actually you don't change the fundamental quantum mechanical properties of the system. So this is a schematic view of what goes on. So basically you've got a, a beam of neutrons coming in from the side over here. And these three blue blocks are what's known as an interferometer. And then we're just gonna detect what comes out the other end. The other thing you need to know is that neutrons have a spin associated with them. Um, they act like little rotating bodies and in this weird quantum mechanical world you can align them with their spins in different directions, typically up and down or forwards and backwards. But you can align the spins, you can play around with the spins of these particles. Professor, when we talk about the spin of a neutron, should I be imagining like a planet spinning on its axis or is it a different property? Yes and no is the short answer to that in that it behaves very much like a, a body spinning on its axis. It has many of the same properties, but actually you are in this weirdly fundamentally quantum mechanical world where actually the particle, you can't think of it as a little sphere, solid sphere. If it's an electron, it's completely point-like, for example, but you can still have a spin associated with it. So you shouldn't be thinking about these things as solid spheres. You've got to think about them as fundamentally different sorts of entity, but nonetheless, they still have a, a property which is analogous to the rotation of a little sphere. So we've got a beam of neutrons heading into this apparatus, and they've been oriented so that their spins are all pointing upwards. Okay, which is just to say, you know, that you can think of them going around clockwise or anti-clockwise, and you can think of that as the spin pointing up or the spin pointing downwards. And it's just convenient to show that rotation as an arrow. This thing is an interferometer, which basically splits that beam of neutrons into two. Now this is where we get into the weird quantum mechanical world, because actually you can't think of one neutron going this way and another neutron going this way. In this weird quantum mechanical world, one particle actually follows both paths. We're getting into these pr properties of quantum mechanical things that they behave a bit like waves, in that we split our beam so our particles go both ways, and then when they recombine coming out the other side, we can actually generate these interference effects. What we can actually think of the neutron as a wave going this way and a wave going this way, and depending on exactly how we orient the apparatus, sometimes those waves will add up in a constructive way, and so we'll get a big signal. Other places they'll add up in a destructive way and we'll get very little signal. In other words, by messing around with the, the path difference, we can create one of these interference patterns that sometimes we get lots of neutrons coming and then we change the apparatus a little bit and suddenly we get very few neutrons coming. So it's a classic interference experiment. It's one of the classic ways of showing the, this fundamental property of quantum mechanics that things that we think of as particles, neutrons, actually have wave-like properties as well. So that's the, the, the beginning of the setup. Okay, the next thing we need to do is change the apparatus a bit. So the next thing we do is we introduce one of these things called a spin rotator. It takes the spin and twists it round. So instead of pointing upwards, suddenly this spin points backwards. Okay, and we put a spin rotator in one beam that rotates the things one way. We put a spin rotator in the other beam which rotates the particles the other way. So now we've got 
our beam of neutrons go in these two different paths, but actually one of them has its spin aligned in one direction and the other in completely the opposite direction. But again, remember, these are actually still the same neutrons, more or less, that one neutron could be going along both paths and can have its spin simultaneously twisted one way and twisted the other way. Yes, it's all getting very, very weird, I'm afraid. It'll get worse before it gets better. Okay, now when we recombine these two beams, you get no interference effect at all. And that's because one of the properties of, of these particles is they're what's known as in orthogonal states, which means that basically they don't interact with each other when they recombine. And so we don't get these interference effects just because of the way we've set them up with completely spins pointing in completely opposite directions. So what do we get coming out instead? Just, so a just, just get a, a beam of neutrons coming out and we can mess around with the paths all we want and we're never going to see some places where things add up or some places where they don't add up because they don't interfere anymore just because of what we've done with the spins. <laughs> all right. Whoa. Yeah, it's getting worse. All right, I've got three of these. There's another one to come after this. All right, here's page two. So the same apparatus as before. We've just introduced one more element here, which is this little box, which just basically says, is the spin aligned to that, pointing in that direction? Is the spin aligned to the left? Right. A spin identifier. Yes, and if its spin is aligned to the left, it lets it through. If the spin's aligned to the right, it doesn't let it through. It doesn't make any difference. We still get the same kind of thing coming out the other side. We'll probably get a little few, rather fewer neutrons because some of them have been rejected by it, but basically we don't see any interference effects. So now we can ask, okay, so which path, the neutrons that actually get through here, which path did they follow? And actually in a non-quantum mechanical world, the answer to that is kind of obvious, right? Because all the ones over here were pointing to the left, all the ones over here were pointing to the right. This one only lets things that point to the left through, and therefore clearly anything, the only thing that's gonna come out the other side is something that followed this path here. That's obvious in the, in the rational, normal world, but in the world of quantum mechanics, where these two things are kind of tangled up together, it's nowhere near as obvious. But you can do an experiment to figure out which path the neutrons actually followed. And this is where we have to get into this weak measurement thing. We can't do anything very kind of robust because we'll mess up the quantum mechanical system. But what you can do is you can put a little attenuator in, on one, in one beam or the other. So something which just blocks out a few of the neutrons, but it's only a few percent. It's not like, you know, half of them or anything. Like a, like a crocodile just pulling in the odd wildebeest. Exactly, it? and you know, most of the, most of the herd gets by, but, but it just stops one or two. And what you find is when you put it in this upper beam here, indeed the signal level drops that you get out. When you put the same attenuator in the lower beam, nothing happens. And so that immediately tells you that the, the neutrons that we're seeing that have made it through clearly follow this upper path here. Well, I could have told you that, but Exactly. Right. As I say, that's kind of the common sense part. All right, now we get to the non-common sense part. I told you what we're going to try and show is that the particle and its magnetic moment have been separated from each other. Okay. And one way you can do that is by, let's get to the last picture here, we can put a magnet in. Okay, and then what will happen, if you think about what happens here, in the, so I put a magnet here in the upper beam, which is where we know the neutrons that we're actually detecting are going. We've got neutrons going through the lower beam, nothing happens to them at all. When we put a magnet in, that actually starts pulling this spin around, right? Because we've got the, now the, the magnetic moment of the neutron interacts with the magnetic field and that twists the spin around, which means that the, the particle, instead of being set up in this state where it's purely kind of pointing that way, it'll be mostly pointing that way, but a little bit pointing that way. And again, it's one of these weird quantum superposition things, but at least there's some probability associated with these neutrons that they might actually have their spin aligned in the same direction as the lower beam. But not all, this magnet. No. This it, again, it has to be a weak measurement, so it's a very weak magnetic field, which just means a few percent of them will may have you know, this, a few percent probability that it's actually in that state rather than that state. So what should happen now is that some fraction of the neutrons are now aligned in the same direction, their spins are aligned in the same direction on top and bottom, which was the condition we needed for interference to start again. Okay, so we should start seeing fringes again, start seeing the interference effects. Just little weak ones though. Little weak interference, yeah, because we haven't done much, but we should start seeing just a little bit of interference, okay. When you put the magnet in the upper beam, nothing happens. You get no interference coming out the other side. So for whatever reason, these neutrons have not in any way been affected, nothing has happened to them. But it gets weirder because if we put the magnet in the lower beam instead of the upper beam, then we start seeing interference again. So it looks like these particles in the upper beam, their magnetic moments are going the lower route. And we can mess with their magnetic moments in the lower route, and then when we combine the whole thing together, then suddenly we start seeing interference again. 
the magnetic moments are going along the bottom, the particles are going along the, along the top. We showed, we've shown, right, just from the previous experiment with the attenuator, we've shown that the particles we're actually detecting here have all gone through the upper root. But what we've also shown from this experiment is that those same particles' magnetic moments are following the lower root. I think they've stuffed something up. <laughs> this smacks of a mistake. You think they just got, how they, they had the experiment the wrong way up or something? I don't know. Maybe the top magnet wasn't working. Oh, it's the same magnet. So you just move it from the top to the bottom. So it's weird, right? That when you put attenuators in, that tells you that the particles that you're detecting over here are following the upper root. When you put magnets in, that shows you that actually their magnetic moments are tra traveling along the lower root. And so that's this whole thing of the Cheshire cat, right? You've separated the cat from its smile. In this case, you've separated the neutron from its magnetic moment. It turns out there might actually be a use for it too. Do you want a use for it? Let me guess, cryptography. No, not cryptography for a change. <laughs> the use for it is you might, you might want to study some very fundamental property of a particle, but the fact that it has a magnetic moment masks the very subtle effects you're looking for because you know, what the experiment you're trying to do ends up interacting with the magnetic moment of the particle and rather than the very subtle property of the particle you're actually after. Potentially, if you can use this kind of apparatus to separate, physically separate, the particle from its magnetic moment, you can now do your experiments on the particle, the naked particle, without the magnetic moment, and from that actually learn very fundamental properties of nature that you're not going to be able to find when the two are sat on top of each other.